not going to make a statement, I'm just going to uh, introduce Jeremy uh, Mielelista, who's going to give the concluding words. Jeremy Mielelista is the President Emeritus of uh, the Baltic Assembly, and is probably the Estonian politician who has done most uh, for Baltic cooperation over the years, and of course he played a key role in our drive to independence already in the late 1980s. So he is probably the most appropriate and authoritative person to conclude our seminar. So on behalf of all the moderators of all these sessions, thank the audience for sticking with us through these two days and finally give the word to Mr. Bellista. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And first of all, let me thank uh, Professor Kasakam for his very kind introductory words. Uh, well, I understand that uh, uh, time is advancing very quickly and we are probably lagging a little bit behind our schedule. Therefore, I, I quite realize that I should be as brief as I can. But uh, I have been invited just to, to sum up the, the deliberations. Uh, yesterday and today, we have had four panels, uh, two yesterday and uh, two today. And yesterday, yesterday's panels were titled Main Challenges for the Development of the Baltic Societies in the Globalizing World and uh, How to Close the Welfare Gaps in the Baltic Sea Region. And uh, today uh, were this morning we had the language and democracy in the Baltic multi-ethnic societies. Uh, it was uh, moderated by Arthur Leuvakas, and now we just concluded uh, our last panel, EU uh, 2020 and beyond, uh, chaired by Raul Varek. I will dwell in a little bit of detail, uh, mostly on yesterday's panel, because most of the people here or many, many, many of the people here may not have heard yesterday's panel, so I will very briefly recall some of the most interesting things said yesterday, or perhaps some of the, the most uh, important elements of our debate yesterday, and I, I wouldn't uh, uh, repeat uh, in, in detail what, what has been said today, but I will make very <coughs> a few general uh, comments uh, at the end of my my statement. Well, obviously, as we all see, the general heading of our conference is the Baltic Ways 20 years on, and the understatement uh, is our real slogan that is closing the gaps in the Baltic Sea region. So I emphasize the word gap. This is really what our conference has been about how to bridge the gaps between two distinct areas uh, around the, the Baltic Sea, the three Baltic states on the one hand and the Nordic countries uh, on the other. Professor Mario Laustin yesterday made a very good introduction to the conference uh, based on the Estonian Human Development Report. And uh, by way of opening, she asked, uh, what can we do for Europe? and not the other way around. Usually we are used to just asking what Europe could do for us. And Laustin gave us uh, a very good comparative picture of uh, social development in the three Baltic countries. Twenty years ago, she said, we all were on the same common path. We were all almost equal and we were very similar. Now there are significant differences, so, particularly in Human Development Index. It is interesting to note that uh, GDP and the degree of satisfaction go hand in hand in parallel, and it is of course natural. But it is also interesting that in a more specific way that as to satisfaction, uh, it is not entirely clear why that is sometimes satisfaction and that is sometimes that is not. Uh, so it is quite obvious that it is much more difficult to interpret uh, the measurement of satisfaction 
and uh, uh, we were also shown um, the, the world map of, of satisfaction. And interestingly enough, and to me personally, astonishingly enough, uh, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania were painted red on that map. That was a very low degree of satisfaction. We were painted with the same color as Russia. So Estonians, Latvians, and, uh, and Lithuanians were as dissatisfied with themselves as Russians. Uh, and uh, what's even more, I was surprised to just to, to see that even Kazakhs uh, and uh, North Africans, North Africans were more, more satisfied with their life than Estonians, Latvians, and uh, Lithuanians. But of course, the, I think the explanation is obvious. Uh, <coughs> the problem is that we, Estonians, Latvians, and Lithuanians, live next door to Finland and Sweden, to the Nordic countries, and uh, everybody in the world knows, uh, particularly people in the third, in the third world know that uh, the Nordic countries are the top of the world. And if we live next door to the top of the world and we can look out of our window and we can see what is going on, what's happening uh, at the top of the world, uh, and we see we don't have it, then of course we are dissatisfied. So the explanation is, is there. In 1991, we all had to start from scratch and therefore we were prepared to make higher efforts. We were ready to sacrifice, we were ready to suffer. We had very serious drawbacks at that time. Some of them have disappeared, some not. For example, smallness of our nations, social trauma of the Second World War, ethnic uh, heterogeneity, very weak civil society, and of course uh, our ge geographical, geopolitical location, our immediate proximity of Russia. So some factors can't be changed, uh, the proximity of Russia remains. We are next door to Russia as well. But as to civil society, it probably has developed in a while. And there are some other things um, which have changed uh, uh, social trauma, it's a big question mark, but as the smallness of our nations, this can't be changed overnight. It will take a long time until we can change this. Some factors are supporting the Baltic way. Some of them are external, such as the EU integration, Nordic support, foreign investment, and also, paradoxically, the Russian challenge. The Russian challenge could be a positive factor to mobilize ourselves. And then on the other hand, there are internal factors such as desire to catch up uh, this very strong individualism of our people, very strong sense of competitiveness, uh, we want to be competitive, and uh, even a certain feeling of success. You know, the, 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 the saying that success brings about more success. And when we feel we are successful, we immediately want to be even more successful. And this is a positive factor. So these factors have been contributing to the Baltic way. However, the recent economic crisis has been a test of the sustainability of the three Baltic states. And uh, as to the future, as to the, let us say, almost immediate future, uh, what we think, what Estonians, Latvians and, and Lithuanians think uh, of their life in, in five years from now, then the picture is surprisingly very similar to that what Estonians, Latvians and Lithuanians think of their life 20 years ago. And uh, that is a very obvious, uh, clear, tendency that Estonians uh, seem to be more positive and more optimistic, whereas the uh, difference between Latvia and Lithuania is not that big. It is much smaller. So we can say, unfortunately, or I don't know, maybe for Estonians, fortunately, we can say that the three Baltic countries can be divided in, in two groups. Estonia on the one hand and Latvia and Lithuania, unfortunately, on the other hand. 
And now the question was how to bridge the gap, how to bridge the gap, by the way, between Estonia and the other Baltic states. But then, of course, in a more general terms, how to bridge the gap between the Baltic states and the Nordic countries. It was emphasized that we must set new goals, and the new goals must be as concrete as possible, such as creating new efficient infrastructure, energy systems, develop research and development, and uh, enhance innovation. Yesterday, by the way, we celebrated uh, the 20th anniversary, as we all know, we celebrated the 20th anniversary of the Baltic Assembly in the Estonia Concert Hall, and for the first time, the Baltic Assembly awarded uh, the prize for innovation, and the uh, you know, Estonian uh, IT company won it, and I think this is just a good example of what, what we are talking about, what we should do, and the Baltic Assembly, at least in a, in a, in a modest way, and, and uh, the Baltic Assembly and the technological parts of the Baltic states are now trying to do it. It was also emphasized that it is important uh, to enhance in every possible way the uh, social protection and health, but also good governance. Uh, and in the end, or at the end of the day, create uh, a joint Nordic Baltic brand of being small but smart. So Estonia is small and smart, and Denmark is small and smart, and there is no difference in principle between the two. This, this is just one of the, the ideas and proposals put forward yesterday. The first panel yesterday was uh, moderated by Professor Anders Kattekamp, uh, and uh, uh, Mrs. Enne Eregma uh, made some very interesting observations uh, uh, on that panel. She also spoke uh, about us being small, and uh, therefore she said, she said we were unable to create big industries, but we could always uh, put an emphasis on quality. Quality, quality, and quality. That, that means high tech. That means small or medium-sized businesses. But, Erikma also said that in order to achieve that, we need a critical mass of resources, a critical mass of, of money. Without enough money, we can't do it. And she referred to the European Union funding uh, in uh, research and development in science, uh, but only a small fraction, only 5% of all money used uh, science and, and development comes uh, directly from the EU fund, but the 95% of the funds uh, come from national budgets. And so this is, I, I think, the, uh, Mrs. Erdmo said yesterday that EU is all about, is about ag agriculture. EU is nothing else but agriculture. It was very interesting to note that uh, uh, Erdmo also uh, just uh, mentioned one of her personal uh, daydreams. Uh, she said that one day uh, there should be the Nordic Baltic Institute of Technology, uh, as, she called, as she called it, 5N3B, five Nordic, three Baltic countries joining their forces just to create a joint institute of technology. All this may take time, but who knows, maybe it will happen one day. And by uh, 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 way of concluding, Mrs. Eckham asked, uh, can and should we copy the Nordic model? And her honest, her honest answer was, I don't know. There was also a discussion yesterday during that panel about uh, how to break a vicious circle. And the vicious circle is just uh, about what uh, uh, in Erkman described, uh, but also what Mario Lauristin said. Mario Lauristin, for example, emphasized that we can't become smart without investing sufficiently. 
in order to be small and smart, you nevertheless must invest a lot. But how can we invest a lot if we don't have money? But should we get it? The only way to create money is just to have a, a population which is educated. But in order to get an educated population, you must invest in education. So this is an obvious vicious circle. And uh, it is a really very important question to find ways, uh, very concrete ways, uh, how to break the vicious circle and start going and do something. There was one solution offered, that is the PPP, Public-Private Partnership. This is one way how we can get uh, moving perhaps a little quicker than we have done so far. Yesterday, one of the keynote speakers was Joachim Wallner of Sweden. And uh, he emphasized that we must meet our current needs without compromising the needs of the future generations. He described different welfare strategies, uh, such as the strategy of Robin Hood, on the one hand, but also the strategy give those who already have, on the other hand. Uh, Palmer, by the way, also mentioned that, uh, and he warned that the Nordic model is not a miracle. The Nordic model has very many positive aspects, it's world famous, but nevertheless, I don't, don't think that the Nordic model is, is a miracle. It has serious shortbacks as well. And referring to us, uh, Mr. Palme said that during transformation, there are always winners and losers. <coughs> and transformation always brings about what he called destructive destruction, which is a very interesting uh, contradiction in terms that constructive destruction is what has happened in our countries recently. Speaking of the global challenges, including aging of our populations, he emphasized secure the future, that tax base. Have a tax base in the future. That means have children. It is much, much easier to say than to do. And have lifelong education, have early childhood education. Avoid polarization among the young. That is dangerous. If there will be significant polarization among the young generation, this will be serious danger for all of us for the future. And that is a threat that there could be a polarization. Those who are successful will be more successful, and those who are lagging behind will lose everything. And we can see it in many countries. And uh, he summed up that saying that due to global finan financial crisis, but also due to climate change, he also emphasized climate change, due to these two major circumstances, uh, it is time to change our perspective. Now, as to the second panel yesterday, which was moderated by Indre Treufeld, uh, there was one interesting observation by uh, Eitin Esther of the Estonian Parliament. Uh, he said that, uh, in, in essence, uh, the Nordic model is about agreement in society. That is a fundamental agreement in the Nordic society. People listen to one another. It is difficult sometimes to achieve an agreement, but if you have an agreement, it is a great asset. I think it was quite quite an interesting observation. When we look at our own political life, and I have some personal experience in it, uh, and uh, I, I must admit that uh, it's a big problem in our political culture to sometimes to achieve agreement. Of course, there are political cultures which are even worse than ours. But, uh, but we have a long way to go in developing our own political culture in order to be able to, to reach an agreement on important matters. 
Professor Ulmas Varglane said yesterday that, and that is very interesting again, that he said that we have a reasonable amount of knowledge, but we don't know how to transform that knowledge into concrete achievement. In other words, we don't know how to sell ourselves. We are clever people. We know a lot, and sometimes we can even do a lot. But we, we can't sell it to anybody so that we will get something in return. And in, 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 in the opinion of Professor Vardalan, this is a major, this is a crucial problem for us. But many, in his opinion, many people in the Baltic states are not even aware of this problem. Even during the Soviet occupation, we learned to think, we learned to read, we learned to make all sorts of things even with our hands. But the only thing we never learned was how to sell things. We don't know how to sell, but this is what we simply have to learn from others, from older democracies. People in older democracies know how to sell. And uh, by way of concluding uh, yesterday's uh, deliberations, uh, I would just like to refer to Professor Matti Heitmans. Uh, I like some, some of the things he said. Uh, he raised the question, why is Estonia the best country to live in? Usually, we don't ask that question. We ask, uh, why are people leaving Estonia why are people, people living in Latvia or Lithuania? But we should uh, much more often think, uh, think of it. Why is Estonia such a wonderful country to live in, particularly for Estonians themselves? And uh, 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 Professor Heitman said that uh, life is not only about money. Money is certainly very important, and we all know when we are short of money, it's a very serious problem. We all know it, what it means. It, it's a terrible problem when there is not enough money. But nevertheless, uh, Professor Aitens uh, thought it uh, important to emphasize that life is not only about money. There are some things about Estonia which are so valuable. And, and then he called on all of us uh, just to, to, to think on and, and put forward the, the, the possible factors why Estonia is such a nice place to live. And I can, I can say on my own behalf, my, my own feelings are, well, first of all, in Estonia, we do not have tsunamis. We do not have earthquakes. So we, when we have them, very small and very seldom. Very weak, very weak earthquakes and very seldom. So this is a very good uh, asset. I'm very happy we don't have tsunami. Then we don't have terrible floods, even in Central Europe, even in, in, <coughs> in Czechoslovakia, or even in Hungary, in, in Romania, in such countries you sometimes have terrible floods because you have mountains, then you have rivers, and then the water comes down from the mountains, and then all your streets are flooded. In Estonia, well, very small floods sometimes. Some streets in Tallinn, you know, you just can't bike bicycle properly. So it's a very big asset. We don't have uh, we don't have uh, droughts, not serious one at least. We very seldom have excessive snow, and when we have some, it's quite nice. We like it. So we can we can continue, and then uh, maybe just uh, summing it up, uh, one can say that life is relatively safe here. It is safe to live here. You can go out, you can walk, nothing happens to you. So. We should, uh, when, when we just uh, call on our, our countrymen just to come back to Estonia, then we should not necessarily talk only about salaries. That if you come, if you come back here, you get a better salary here than you get over there. But we should, we should just uh, remind those things. They, they are far away, and they have seen the floods, and they have seen the tsunamis, and maybe some of them will think of it and, and come back. And now. Let me just uh, come to the concluding part of my, my statement. Uh, last night, uh, as I said, in the Estonia Concert Hall, we celebrated the, the 20th anniversary of the Baltic Assembly. And one element uh, of that celebration was uh, traditionally 
awarding the, uh, the Baltic Assembly laureates uh, their, their prizes, their awards. Uh, and uh, Professor Anders Kasekamp uh, was uh, one of those uh, yesterday, and I would like to see this opportunity to publicly once again congratulate him. Uh, but the reason, the specific reason I'm doing so, because I would like to conclude my my observations um, of this conference uh, with um, certain remarks um, which really rely on what I have read in Professor Kasekam's book. I, I reread that very good um, overview of old history recently. And uh, I think it is important that when we discuss the, 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 the three Baltic states, uh, when we discuss their future, when we can bear social criteria, economic criteria, political matters, uh, in my opinion it is extremely important in order to understand uh, the notion of Baltic identity properly it is important to, of course, to have a diachronic approach. That means we need to know a little bit about each other's history, just a little more than the last 20 years or even uh, last 70 years. We need to know a little more. Then we understand much better what is wrong with the Baltic identity and what is right, what goes well and what doesn't go so well with uh, enhancing and developing the Baltic identity. And when you read uh, the book about uh, uh, the integrated history of Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia, then you really understand and you realize that Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia are more different from one another than England, France and Germany. In my opinion, England, France and Germany are much more similar as a group than Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. Uh, typically, people far away take the Baltic states as one entity, and they even ask, them, do you all speak the same language, or do you understand each other's language? But uh, other countries are very different. If you compare Estonia and Latvia, we are very similar in mentality because of the centuries of the common Lutheran religion. Then Northern Latvia is, is Practically, they, they are the, the ancient thieves who have just switched over to the Latvian language. And as, as we know, the, the, stress, uh, the stress in the Latvian language is always on the first syllable. And uh, this, of course, is the impact of the external but of the real language. And then when you look at Lithuania, Lithuania used to be one of the greatest superpowers in Europe across many centuries, together with Poland. And uh, Lithuania is, uh, is very, very different. And I had personal experience in the Baltic Assembly across 12 years. Uh, and uh, I can uh, assure you that uh, what I read in, uh, in the book by Professor Kasekamp uh, only reinforces uh, some of the impressions uh, I have just uh, uh, received uh, personally and practically. But uh, having said all that, uh, I think. Uh, the more we accept and the more we admit that Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania are different in objective terms, the more important it is uh, to foster our common identity because we should never forget that we have been in the same boat during the most complicated and difficult times. And our recent identity, of course, has been formed mostly by World War I and in particular World War II and such dates as the, the 14th of June or the 25th of March are very important elements in, in, in forging our common identity when our people were in the same frames. And this we should never forget, and we should never forget that, that the matter of uh, Baltic cooperation in the first place is always about uh, survival. This is an existential concern, and I quite agree with Mark Bonitas on what he said just recently, uh, a few minutes ago, that Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, above all, should cooperate in defense. There is no denying that. This is really very, very important, and I'm, I'm very proud that Estonia is continuing the 
the system of uh, compulsory military conscription, we have a very sizable and, and, and serious uh, reserve army. As a, as a former member of the Baltic Assembly, I have repeatedly regretted that uh, Latvia and Lithuania has given up uh, the conscription system and uh, uh, Latvia and Lithuania are relying only on professional armed forces which are very small. And this is certainly no good for our future. But we should work together, we should uh, persuade one another, we should always <coughs> offer support to one another, and we should always think that, we, we should always ask the question, what is predictable future? There is a general saying that there is no danger for us in the predictable future. But we should all, always know how many years does that mean and what will happen beyond predictable future. Therefore, let me conclude by once again congratulating everybody on the 20th anniversary of the Baltic Assembly. And let me just, as a, as a former president of the Baltic Assembly, let me express my sincere gratitude to those people who have organized uh, today's and yesterday's event and of course above all I think this uh, spirit was more behind that. So thanks so much. <laughs>